there are a lot of writers that I wrote with that do, don't have a song on this album. That doesn't mean to say I didn't write a song either. I wrote with a lot of different people. I think that it just is very stimulating. No two people write the same way. And it's each, each pairing with different people, or sometimes I wrote with two other people at the same time, which is a little bit more difficult, but it's like, it just pushes you, stimulates you, inspires you to do different things within your own framework of how you work, if you know what I mean. Because I'm not going to write a song that doesn't sound like me. That would be, uh, in fact, I did come up with a few of those, which will probably be later on for, for other people. But um, I firmly believe that Hold Tight and Mind Over Matter might not have been as good. They're solely written by me might not have been that good had it not been for the fact that the day before I wrote with somebody else, maybe that song wasn't used, but it pushed me to write on my own something, you know. So it, it all, it's all just like a continuous wheel of activity. No, I think, I think it's just equally as difficult to come up with something new um, in, in the guitar area. Um, it's something that comes the easiest to me. This album is the way it is because that's the way it came out. There was no conscious effort to um, make it hard or soft or whatever. That's the, the way I wrote and that was the way it was going to be. The only uh, reason um, for going back and going on to another song and dropping a song was that it wasn't good enough for the record. There was no like, well, I'm definitely going to make a, a, uh, a heavier album. That wasn't, that wasn't on the cut. Yeah, it was just the way it happened. Uh, as, as far as working with uh, David and that affecting the record, yes. I don't think you can actually pinpoint how it affected it. I just don't think it would have been as good if I'd have gone straight in done David's album and then gone back in and done my my record I think the fact that I did his record went away on the road with him for like nearly a year um, just got me my mind off my career and let me just think about look at my own career from a different angle To be able to get away and diversify, uh, it's like sort of Phil Collins playing with, with Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton playing with Roger Waters. I mean, it's just, it was great for them to do that because it just, they were able to sit back, be part of a band and play and just enjoy themselves. If you like, that was exactly what it was. Back to almost humble pie-ish for me, except it wasn't my band and it was a, I was playing behind a solo artist, but... Um, playing with David, great band, um, being the guest, uh, special guest guitarist, a hired gun, blowing guitar solos for two and a half hours a night for ten months was amazing. I mean, it was just what the doctor ordered. Well, it was it's just unbelievable to me that that I was actually in the room with Phil Spector, Ringo Starr, Klaus Vormann, Billy Preston, George Harrison, Phil Collins unbeknownst to me was in there playing tambourine. Um, I don't even remember that. Um, uh, Gary Wright was playing piano. Um, Eric Clapton was not on the sessions that I was on, but I mean, I'd be going walking out. Eric would be walking in, and we knew each other. Oh, hi, big hi, Eric. And we knew each other to say hi to, you know. Um, but and then see, I did, but I was very clever because I just took out my notebook and said, um, uh, "Excuse me, Billy. Um, now, when I make my solo record, what is the number? Where can you be reached?" Is it? <laughs> yeah, boy, okay, yeah. Well, here's my number, but, uh, yeah, right, okay, when you make your solo record, right. So I called him, and he came, <laughs> and so did Ringo, and I had to actually audition uh, the three songs that I wanted Ringo to play on. He came to my house in St. John's Wood, the one that was just around the corner from Abbey Road, and I played just me and an acoustic in front of him and Maureen, his wife at the time, three songs. Can you imagine how nervous I was? 
Um, and he liked two of the three, which was, in fact, I think three. He played on all three. There are a lot of writers that I wrote with that do, don't have a song on this album. That doesn't mean to say I didn't write a song either. I wrote with a lot of different people. I think that it just is very stimulating. No two people write the same way. And it's each, each pairing with different people, or sometimes I wrote with two other people at the same time, which is a little bit more difficult. But it's like, it just pushes you, stimulates you, inspires you to do different things within your own framework of how you work, if you know what I mean. Because I'm not going to write a song that doesn't sound like me. That would be, uh, in fact, I did come up with a few of those, which will probably be later on for, for other people. But um, I firmly believe that Hold Tight and Mind Over Matter might not have been as good. They're solely written by me. Might not have been that good had it not been for the fact that the day before I wrote with somebody else, Maybe that song wasn't used, but it pushed me to write on my own something, you know. So it, it all, it's all just like a continuous wheel of activity. No, I think, I think it's just equally as difficult to come up with something new um, in, in the guitar area. Um, it's something that comes the easiest to me. First time I heard the Beatles was in 19, must have been 1962, when they released um, Love Me Do. And I must have seen them on something like Thank You Lucky Stars or Ready Steady Go, or some, whatever was on at that. Yeah, we went, David and I went to the same school for about a year. And um, I, I knew of him before I went to the school because my father was his art teacher and was the head of the art department there. And so I'd, I'd heard about Jones, as he's known to my father. And um, so when I got there, you know, I, I, it was known very, I made it known very quickly that I play guitar too. Um, and the only people that were playing guitar at that point were much older than me. So I, would, I hung out with David and George Underwood, his close friend. And um, they introduced me to the music of Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, all those uh, earlier... Um, American rock and roll artist. My father had already introduced me to Django Reinhardt's music, but I hated it at that point when I first heard it. Uh, well, two things. For me, when I write something fr from the, the, for the choice of the song to start with, it's blatantly obvious to me whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And there's more indifferent than there are bad, and uh, more of both of those than there are good. Um, so that is so obvious to me what, what is groundbreaking for me uh, something new but still me if you know what I mean uh, on the other hand I did 50% of the work was done at home in my own studio and then Chris Lord Algy my co-producer I would take the tapes to him we go to a, uh, a larger obviously studio, professional studio, and we'd gradually replace instruments. We'd put, replace the drum machine with drums. We'd replace maybe the bass synth with a bass player or me playing bass. We'd double the guitars, replace the guitars, whatever. Um, put other singers on, obviously. So he was my uh, mirror, if you like. You know, he, he was the other pair, and he wasn't working on it all the time. So I would, I would come to him with um well no he come actually let's let's get this right the geography of this right he would come round to my place to my studio and said look i got seven new songs i'd play him the seven he'd go well i like four of them and i said well those are the four that i like or we disagree or but usually it was painfully obvious where we were going you know it's just especially when you get with somebody else who you respect as as a as um, a producer, engineer, mixer, and he's got these golden pair of ears, Chris Lordalgy. His perception of balance is quite incredible. I mean, he's really tremendous. And the overall production of the album, you know, has a lot to do with me, but it also has a lot to do with him. That you can say no um, to doing 
interviews if you don't really feel that you should do a particular interview or you don't feel you should do a particular TV show or you just get a bad feeling about doing a movie maybe or certain things like that knowing that to go from your instincts and to not be swayed by someone who's going to make a buck out of what you're going to do that's the media can be controlled it can't be stopped but it can be controlled to a certain degree and that is that's a big big lesson because if you hit big they're gonna um, eat you up and spit you out and when they're done with you you're finished music video today um, by Peter Frampton <coughs> um, I think that it's unfortunate that it's so important um, not that I don't enjoy making them I do because um, I've been sort of interested in film as almost as long as I've been interested in, in, in music so that that's no big deal for me and, and I really do enjoy making them um, I find it disconcerting that that they are so important and it just sort of robs the listener I think of his own imagination sometimes um, especially when it's spelt out you know, when it's line for, which, are, you know, less and less videos are doing that, I think, I hope. But my idea of a, I mean, if, if you think of, let's think of uh, two Peter Gabriel videos. Let, let's face it, he's one of the best video makers. I mean, wonderful. Uh, Sledgehammer is unbelievable. And then, with all of his animation and everything, and then the one he did with Kate Bush, which is, um, was the ballad of So. Don't give up. 